All right. So Abdel here is going to tell us all about the many different acronyms uh, regarding software supply chain I'll and try what to. they mean and why we should care about them. So, sure. Thank yeah, you. Welcome, Abdel. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so this is going to be a... I'm going to do a demo at the end. I'm going to show one of these tools that exists in the software supply chain security ecosystem. But really, the goal of this session is to sort of level set and kind of make sure that everybody understands what we mean by Salsa and SIGSTORE and SBOM and software supply chain security and all these, um, these like buzzwords that we've been using in the last two, 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 two years or so. And um, I'm going to try to cover the basics. This is not going to be a comprehensive talk. It's a huge ecosystem. There's a lot of tools. But hopefully, you will be able to at least be able to understand what these terms mean. Um, my name is Abdel. I'm a cloud developer advocate at Google. I'm also the Kubernetes podcast co-host. Um, I don't know if there are any people listening here. Three people. OK, I'll give you a minute for the others to sign up. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I, um, I've been at Google for like almost nine years. I've done quite a lot of implementations on Kubernetes and software security on service mesh. Um, and this is kind of my, 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 my main area of focus. Um, every single slide that talks about security starts with, hey, there are challenges, right? Everybody knows this. So I'm not going to talk here about challenges in terms of securing systems, because pretty much security or system security or IT security in the last 10, 15 years have mostly been focused on how can we keep the bad guys out of our system, secure in production, right? Um, what have happened over the last five, couple of years is that malicious attackers or bad people who are trying to get into your system are trying to find new ways to do so, right? Um, we all heard of these incidents in the last couple of years. Solar winds is an incident that impacted the intercontinental pipeline, which is a gas and oil pipeline that supplies the US East Coast with gas and, 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 and oil. And it just wrecked havoc, long lines in, uh, uh, in gas stations, people trying to, to, get, to get their hands on gas because they were afraid there would be a shortage. Um, Log4j, everybody knows that one. Um, next gen, everybody knows, um, uh, well, yeah, everybody knows that one. I think one that is pretty much more closer to us in Europe. Um, it specifically happened in Sweden, where I live. Um, so in Sweden, we have a, a supermarket chain called Coop. Um, they have about 500 stores across the country. And last year, I think around November 2022, they basically had to shut down the entire, uh, all their supermarkets for 24 hours. Because what happened to them is they were using um, a, a company, a random IT company, that manages their self-checkouts and their uh, cashiers, right? And that third-party company used a software called Kaseya, which is like a patch management and asset management software. Kaseya is a third-party company that just makes software, so that's basically off-the-shelf software for you. And Kaseya, what they did is that they basically pulled a dependency from the internet for one of their Node.js applications, and they just packaged it into their app, tested it, it worked, they shipped it into their customers. So they shipped it into that random third-party company, which then just shipped it into all the... Uh, self-service checkouts and cashiers of Coop, which is the end customer. And what happened is essentially that that vulnerability had a backdoor and somebody managed to get into Coop system through that backdoor, forcing them to shut down. So the reason I'm mentioning this specific example is because software supply chain kind attacks are becoming so complex in the sense that Software is inherently complicated because you are depending on other people who depend on other people who depend on other people. And instead of a malicious attacker trying to attack you in your system, in your production system, which you are already spending a lot of money and resources in securing, they can just go and try to you know, inject a backdoor or inject a vulnerability in one of the dependencies that they know you are depending on or somebody else depends on. And the effect of this is, is like a nesting doll type situation, is that by injecting the vulnerability into one library, you can basically multiply your, your attack surface by an order of magnitude. Um, so let's see how software is, is built today, right? Well, you as a developer, you basically have your you know, editor um, that you use to edit your source code. Um, then you depend on dependencies from the internet, NPM packages, you know, uh, APT packages, Maven, Java, whatever those packages could be. Uh, Docker packages also, or Docker dependencies, those, those are all dependencies. And most developers, and this is not to say that developers are lazy, because they are, but most of developers don't really give it a second thought. 
You just pull dependencies from the internet, you need a library, you pull it because that library allows you to do your work and you don't really think about it too much. Now, then you package your application and then you send it to your runtime and then you go have a good weekend, right? The issue here is that even your dependencies have their own dependencies, right? Even the way a library is shipped to you so you can use it also uses some sort of CI-CD pipeline to be able to be available for you. It's not, the, the end result of that CI-CD pipeline is not an application that you run in production, it is a library, it's a dependency, right? And so that's why I, I meant when I said this like nesting doll kind of effect. Um, and so this can, can, can be, this can be problematic in many ways. You could start with a vulnerable package, you write your own code, your code is good, um, you're a good developer, you do good work. Um, you have a clean development pipeline. Um, you have a, a legitimate channels, by legitimate channels I mean you have a legitimate way to take your, your software and then distribute it to your production systems. Hopefully, um, and I'm gonna put you probably on the spot here, you're not rebuilding your artifact between dev and stage and production, anybody does that? All right, some good developers in the room, good. Okay. Um, and then you end up with a vulnerable software just because you had a vulnerability to start with in a package you depended on. You could start with a vulnerable package, then get it through like a clean pipeline, but then eventually you do an update, right? How many of you have an apt get install dash p in their Docker file? Right, one, two people, because why not, right? So, okay, how many of you have dependencies without tags? They don't, they don't pin dependencies to like a specific version or specific commit SHA or specific, no one, really? Okay, I, I find that very hard to, to believe. Um, um, or you can start with like a, a clean code and you, you basically have a vulnerable uh, source code. You have an internal malicious attacker. This could happen, right? Um, um, I'm not gonna mention cases when this happened because they are sometimes a little bit sensitive because you know you end up hiring a right person but they end up to be a rogue employee which have happened before. But I can give example where somebody actually managed to demonstrate that. Um, I don't remember the names, I don't remember the, it was like four years ago, a, 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 a researcher, a security researcher managed to get commit code to the, the source code repository of Homebrew. Homebrew, the software that you use to install stuff on your Mac. So this researcher, in, in an effort to demonstrate that it's easy to become a malicious attacker, started committing legitimate code toward the open source repository, toward the Git repository, and then eventually the maintainer of Homebrew trusted this person, and they were like, well, this is a good actor, so we're just gonna give them a maintainer access. This was back in the days when branch protection was not a thing on GitHub, so you could not actually say, my main branch uh, cannot be committed to unless it comes through peer reviewed, pull request, blah, blah. So once that person got committer access, they managed to prove, well, I could basically just commit code directly into the main branch without having anybody review my code, right? So that's an example of a malicious inter internal attacker or malicious internal actor. Or you could start with a clean package. You have clean code, so everything go, uh, looks good, but you depend on a third party CI software and that third party CI software gets hacked. Um, everybody remember CircleCI last year? They got a bunch of their AWS keys and their customer AWS keys leaked into the internet. So you are depending on somebody that they t you think they are, they know what they're doing, but they don't. Um, so there are actually, basically what I'm trying to say here is there are multiple ways to screw things up. Um, that's because the way we supply our, 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 our software from the developer laptop all the way into production is an increasingly complex system which can have multiple attack vectors. And the, it just, I'm gonna pause here for a second. The reason why we say software supply chain and the reason why people use the same terminology in the supply chain for food is because it's pretty much the same analogy. So assuming I'm a bad actor and I want to poison intoxicate an entire city, an entire village, well, all I have to do is go to the source of water and then put poison there, right? And then eventually that poison will be filtered through the filtration distribution system and get to people, bottles and tabs, and then I can, I can poison them, right? I'm not saying that I have tried to do that before, but I'm just giving an example. Um, so the analogy here is that you are starting with code that you, you trust, but through the process of getting your code from your developer laptop all the way to your production, you have steps where every single step, something could potentially go wrong, right? So that's, that's, that's the, 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 the whole point here. 
So the question now is now what? So I've been telling you all the problems, so how can we potentially solve these issues? This whole software supply chain security and potentially being vulnerable to packages and software that you depend on on the internet started an entire movement that people called shift left movement or the zero trust movement. I dislike the term zero trust because that's coming from networking and when you use it in the software uh, world, A, developers don't understand it and B, it doesn't make any sense. I like more the term shift left. So what does shift left mean? And I know every single time I presented this slide in front of developers, I see their eyes wide open because they go like, hey, uh-oh, here comes more work, right? <laughs> Basically, now as a developer, I have to care about security. The point there is not that you make your developer responsible for security, but you make them aware of what they are doing. You provide them with tools that can allow them to see what they are doing, see what code they are writing, if the code they are writing is clean or not, if they are depending on vulnerable dependencies, and then also, you make sure that when they write code and package it, that they sign it so you can trust that the source code came from the right set of people. Right? I'm, and and my, my demo is going to be about that at the end. But essentially, the idea here is instead of just trying to focus all your security effort on the runtime, you try to shift some of those efforts toward the developer. Right? Um, so, a few years back, a bunch of companies got together and they decided, well, one way we could solve this is try to make open source safe. And an effort called SIGSTOR got started. So SIGSTOR is essentially a community of developers working for different companies, um, Google, Netflix, etc., and then one entity called the Open Software Security Foundation, the Open SSF, they got together and created an effort called SIGSTOR. So SIGSTOR does multiple things. They mainly work on tools and frameworks, right? So they have a set of open source tools that you can use to implement trust, zero trust, shift left, scanning, et cetera, et cetera. And then they have a set of frameworks or best practices. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a community effort. It's a lot of companies. ChainGuard is one of the, the main founders of SIGSTOR, and then a bunch of other companies joined them over time. So these are some of the components they release in terms of open source tooling. Cosign is a tool for signing and verifying the signature of OCI images. That's the tool I'm going to demo later. Uh, Recore is a transparency log. So with Cosign, the way Cosign works is that you can take an artifact and you can sign it with a key. The key could be coming from anyone, anywhere, but they have a, a Felucio, which is a free root certificate. So you can actually use Felucio to generate a key, use the key with Cosign to sign your image, and once you do that, then the logs for this signature will be stored in Record. Record is just a public ledger for uh, signature and verification. OpenID Connect is an identity server that you can use um, to be able to authenticate as Cosign. They have a certificate authority, obviously, if you want certificates. And then they have a, a root of trust for all their uh, PKI infrastructure. So these are some of the components that SIGSTOR releases in terms of open source tools. This is how they think their stuff should be used in the open source space. Essentially, if you're a developer doing open source tooling, you can use Felicio as the certificate authority uh, using OpenID Connect to, to authenticate to it. You use that to sign your certificates, to sign your, um, your, your artifacts, your libraries. Um, the signature or the logs for the signature will be stored in Record. Then um, your end user could either use Record to search for evidence that the specific artifacts have been signed, or they can actually use Cosign with Felucio to verify the signature. Right? So this could be a way to establish trust between open source developers and open source maintainers and people who depend on those open source tools. Right? Um, if you are a Kubernetes user, starting Kubernetes 1.26, every single Kubernetes image, so every single image which is component in the Kubernetes ecosystem is signed using this tool. You can go into Recore. Recore exists, is like, I think, six star slash Recore, and you can filter by Kubernetes version 127, which was just released last week, and you will find the evidence that the, of signature of every single version. Or you can just use Cosign, and then you say, this is the image I'm trying to deploy. Was this image uh, uh, signed, and it will be verified for you, right? They also came up with something called Salsa. Um, and it's not really Salsa, it's S-L-S-A, which stands for Software Level of Something Assurance. I always forget what Salsa means, so I always have to look it up. Um, yeah, Supply Chain Level for Software Artifacts. So what is Salsa? Salsa is essentially a security framework, a set of standards, a set of best practices that says if you have a CI-CD pipeline, a CI-CD system, which is your software supply chain system, if it meets certain criterias, 
then it could be identified as SALSA level one compliant, level two compliant, level three compliant, level four compliant. Obviously, the higher the level is, the more secure your system is. What does effectively mean are things like, so SALSA breaks down the software supply chain security into four different components. How your source code is stored and controlled, how is your system built, how do you generate provenance? Provenance is essentially adding metadata to the artifact that says how these artifacts have been built and who built it. Um, you can think of provenance as a recipe for um, if you are making food. Provenance is your recipe, and then the ingredients are the dependencies. When you take your source code and your dependencies and you put them together in a build system, that's the ingredients. Provenance is the recipe that tells you how these artifacts have been built, right? Essentially, in other terms, if you have the provenance of, a, of, a, of an artifact, you can reverse engineer and go back and see who built this tool and how it was built. Um, and then you have a bunch of common tools. And then for each level, it essentially has certain um, checks. Like, for example, is your build system scripted? Yes. Is your provenance available? Are you attaching metadata to the artifact that says how this artifact was built? Yes, then you are sort of level one compliance, right? Level two, um, your code has to be uh, version controlled, so you have to have some sort of Git repository. Your uh, build is scripted, but it depends on a build service, so you're not running it locally or running it on a remote build server. Your provenance is available, which means it's attached, but it's also authenticated, so it's signed. The provenance itself is signed because it's metadata, it's a JSON file. And then is it service generated? In other terms, you're not writing the provenance yourself, you're using a tool to generate it, et cetera, et cetera. So essentially, the more, um, the higher you go, the more secure or safe is your software supply chain, right? And I want to stop here if there are any questions. Actually, I think I'm going a little bit ahead of time. Go back, one. Yeah. What's the O in reproducible? Um, uh, optional. <laughs> Not doesn't have to be there because the problem with reproducible is that if you have the, the if you have the entire provenance of an artifact, reproducing it means you have access to all the, the dependencies that have been used to build that artifact, and you might not have have access to those dependencies. Right, so if you're depending on a third-party software by a third-party company, they might or might not w make their dependencies available for you so you can re reproduce the artifact. Make sense? Then we have something called SBOM, which stands for Software Bill of Material. How many people have heard of SBOM before? How many of the, you generate SBOM? Two people, three people, four people, okay. What do you do with, with it? I'm curious, like those who generate SBOM, why do you do it? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> That's, I am also in DevRel, so I talk about it. But the people in the back, like, be, like do you generate it just because it's a compliance thing, or? It's for, it's for the compliance and also for, um, you get a nice overview of the basic licenses as well. Okay. You also need to ensure that what kind of third party libraries and what licenses you're using. Right? Awesome. Okay, so, so SBOM, basically, the, me, the, the idea of SBOM is you generate metadata of how a certain artifacts have been built and you attach it. The metadata is which, what library have been used, where is it coming from, who built it, which license have it been deployed, everything is in the slide, I'm not saying anything, I'm not bullshitting you. So essentially all the package information about the dependencies. Um, they can be generated into different formats, uh, Cyclone, DX, SPDX. SPDX, I think, is what the format that Docker generates. So Docker has an experimental command. If you do Docker X SBOM, it will build an artifact, but it will also generate the SBOM and attach it. And there are, so SBOM is still very early in its existence today. In Europe, there are actually some, um, some uh, regulations called NIS-1 and NIS-2. Those are European Union um, regulations for certain sectors like companies doing oil and gas, healthcare, blah, blah. They're actually forcing them to generate SBOM. They're not telling them what, 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 what do you have to do with it. They're just telling them generate SBOM and just leave it there uh, for now. There are multiple ways you could use SBOM. One of the ways I have d done before with customers I worked with when, on SBOM implementations is basically generate SBOM and just treat it as a, as a data pipeline issue. SBOM is a JSON. If you have a tool that can read SBOM from all your artifacts, then it can allow you to query those metadata to say, am I using a license I'm not supposed to be using? Uh, which vulnerability, which uh, libraries I'm depending on, which version of which libraries. It can give you a nice overview of your entire artifact store, whatever. Like, what am I using, right? So SBOM and Salsa work together. There are actually certain, uh, certain um, requirements in Salsa for generating and storing SBOM. So these are not separate from each other. They, they, they complement each other in a way. 
And I want to leave a little bit of time for my demo before I move on to the, the last picture, the big picture. So I'm going to show you a very, oh, sorry about that. I have to see. This is the joy of doing things over SSH, right? Uh, let me, um, give me a second. Can you see my terminal in the back? It's very small. What about now? Bigger? All right, give me a second. Okay, cool, I have my cluster. So what I have here is I have a Kubernetes cluster, um, um, just a standard GKE cluster running on Kubernetes is 1.26. And what I'm gonna demonstrate is cosine, right? So cos I told about cosine earlier, cosine is a command line tool that can be used to sign artifacts. You can either use certificates from Felucio, or if you are using cloud, you can use basically any KMS, any key management system. All the cloud providers have some sort of KMS. I'm gonna use Google KMS, but it would work with Azure and AWS and all the other ones. So I'm just gonna export certain uh, environment variables here, which will make my life easy. And I'm gonna start by doing uh, something. So let's say that my CTO tells me, hey, can we deploy a Docker image? So my first instinct as a DevOps, DevOps person is just go and do a Docker pull in Nginx, right? And I'm gonna ask you to tell me what I'm doing wrong here. So what I'm doing, Ryan, I'm just pulling Nginx from the internet, right? From somewhere, right? <laughs> the most trusted place of anything you need. So, but because I am uh, not allowed to deploy stuff from Docker Hub directly into my, 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 uh, my, uh, my Kubernetes cluster, I can, my cluster can, but let's just assume I can't. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna download the image to my laptop and I'm gonna tag it to push it to my own artifact registry, right? Every single enterprise have an artifact registry, so I'm just tagging it, and then I am pushing it to my um, uh, artifact registry, right? So, so I'm just gonna wait a second and show you my image here. Uh, it's gonna be pushed eventually, yes. Please, and I'm gonna go, I think it's here, if I'm not mistaken, and I'm gonna have to go to my artifact registry. Um, so I have a container here, and I have my Docker container which I just updated, right? So I pushed my container image, it's there, right? So now, well, technically nothing prevents me from just going here and doing something like um, kubectl, sorry, kubectl create deployments dash dash image, boom. So I'm just creating a deployment, um, deploy deployments, should be like this, no? Ah, you have to give it a name. So, nothing too fancy, I just pulled an image, pushed it into a container registry and deployed it, right? I should be able to go to my CTR and say, hey, job done. I just closed the Jira tickets, all good. Um, but obviously this is not how it should be. I pulled a random image from the internet, I don't know where it's coming from, I don't trust it, and just pushed it into my container registry, and then I deployed it into my GK cluster. Now, if I want to do this uh, properly, um, obviously I'm using Nginx because I don't want to have an app that I'm building, I'm just assuming this is an app you are building, right? It's your own container image. So what I'm gonna do instead is that I'm gonna use cosine to sign my image. So cosine has a, a sign flag. It takes a key. You see that it says GCP KMS. They're just like a key management system for Google Cloud. It could be AWS, it could be Azure. It's just like an asymmetric, so it's a key that can be used for encryption and decryption. I'm using it to generate a signature. Uh, and then I'm passing the key name and I'm passing the container name, right? So I'm gonna do this. Um, this is gonna take a little bit of time. So but basically what it's gonna do, is gonna generate a signature for my image and it will upload the signature and attach it to the image as metadata, right? So if I go back to my artifact registry here, I should be able to see that I have a signature which was just pushed right now. And if I look into it, it's essentially a JSON payload which has a signature, right? Just a random SHA-256, thank you, 265. So, now, I could verify it. Um, uh, I could also, I could use cosine to verify it. So this is what I mean when I said earlier the, the shift left movement. 
So when I, when I took that image and I signed it, this is me as a developer establishing trust. I used the key to sign the, 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 the artifacts. I pushed it to container registry. Now anybody who wants to deploy that, that container can basically verify that it was signed. So they could use cosign with the same key to see, can you verify this image signature against the key? And it says here, the signature were verified against the specific public key. So my image have been signed properly. So now I can actually, Cosign has uh, an admission controller. It has a, 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 a tool for Kubernetes where you can deploy an admission controller. And then you can deploy a policy to say, before an image gets deployed, please verify the signature against the key, right? So I'm just going to create the policy here. It, you can see you don't have really to know to, to be versed on Kubernetes to know what this thing does. Essentially, it creates a policy that verifies that all the images have been signed against my KMS key. It's the same key I've been using all the time. So now my policy have been created. Good. I think it's probably existed before. But it doesn't matter. So now what I'm going to do, for the sake of testing, I'm going to create a new namespace. And I, you can see here I created a namespace called test, and then I put a label on it called policy.sigstore.dev slash include is true. So basically, the policy exists on the cluster, but the verification will only happen on namespaces where the, where the label have been applied, right? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to redeploy a random image from the internet. So again, um, sorry, I probably have to delete that Nginx deployment I have. Um, yeah, then I will just do this. I will just try to deploy a random Nginx image. It should fail because that Nginx image, again, is coming from the internet. It's not going to be able to deploy because it's not signed. But what I can do is I can try to deploy the image which I signed earlier. So this is my image in my container registry. And that should go through, right? And uh, no, so this is in the. Can you sign it again? You can sign it with as many keys as possible, and it will have to be checked against all the keys. You can use one key to sign all the images. You can use one key per namespace. Um, in the policy here, I used um, a selector which says uh, globe star star. So this essentially will apply this policy on all the images in the namespace that was tagged. But you can have multiple policies that point to multiple keys if you want each namespace to be signed with different key. Make sense? Um, so that's it. My image is running. So I have generated, generated and I have assumed or simulated I'm a developer, wrote an app, produced a container registry, uh, pr produced a container, sorry, uh, pushed it to a container registry, signed it, and then used the signature, used an admission controller to verify that that image has been signed before it's deployed to GKE. Now, I have only a few minutes, so I'm just going to show you one last thing and like warning, a fair warning. This, I'm going to show a Google slide. It's because I'm lazy, I don't like to write diagrams. So this is going to be our vision of how this whole thing could look like. Like, honestly, I just could not find something that has open source tools. So I'm just going to show you um, our version of how this look like. But every single component here can be replaced with open source. That's what I'm trying to say. Starting with source control, Git, right? Cloud workstations, that's basically how do you prevent your developers from cloning code into your laptop. Git pod, there is a tool called Git pod, it's a service. Git pod, P-O-D, literally. Um, it's a workstation in the cloud. You clone your code in a workstation, you destroy it when you are done. No code is cloned in a developer laptop. No one can go into a developer, like hotel room, steal the laptop and take code from it. Um, which have or might not have happened before. Cloud build, any CI tool you want to use, right? Store into artifact registry. Harbor is an open source version. Using cloud deploy, any CD tool you want. Um, using cosign as an admission controller, deploying into Kubernetes, deploying into Lambda, deploying into Google Cloud, deploying into whatever, right? So all of this stuff could be um, replaced with open source tools. For artifact registry, you can use Harbor as a way to store your images, and then you can use Graphias, which is an open source project to do container analysis to look for vulnerabilities. Um, and pretty much every other tool could be replaced with some sort of open source tool that uses something from SIG store to implement the Salsa level compliances. And I talked earlier about shift left. This is essentially what we mean by shift left is trying to make your developers safe in their development environment. With that, thank you very much. I hope it was useful. Any questions? 
Um, so I guess you maybe explain a little bit there at the end um, with the with the shift left. But I guess for someone coming a little bit from cloud operations or platform manager, I guess I do fail to see a little bit how some of these things are responsibility of the developer. Wouldn't it be more task for kind of like app ops or even platform engineering to build this kind of uh, automations in the build pipeline? Well, it's definitely. If, if you are doing platform engineering, it's probably platform engineering team responsibility to build the entire system, to put it together. But it's also also the responsibility to make developers aware of what they're doing. Okay. Providing them with tools that can tell them, okay, you are pushing software, or you are using vulnerability, or you are using dependency, but dependency is vulnerable, yeah. right? So it's, it's, it's a shared responsibility. That's kind of the typical way we would answer yeah. this question. Um, Typically, this kind of, of like end-to-end -end secure pipelines, they would fall within the responsibility of platform engine and devo slash yeah. DevOps team, okay. essentially. Okay. Right? Perfect, thank you. No worries. Any other questions? Yeah. So if I, if I use GitHub, shouldn't I be able to just tick a box and say, hey, I just want uh, Salsa 4 level, you know, and then oh, everything is done for me. GitHub specifically? Yeah. Or, I don't think GitHub does Salsa level 3 compliance. I think, very qu good question. I think part of the uh, generating the SBOM and adding the, the provenance and stuff like that, GitHub and GitHub Actions doesn't do that. You will have to do it yourself. There's a lot of automation that we know we can put in place with GitHub Actions and the CI and so on, but wouldn't it be super useful if we could just, you know, let's tick a box and, you know, everything gets signed, published, oh, yeah. and... It would be very useful. I think we have to ask Microsoft what are they doing. I mean, GitHub belongs to Microsoft, so maybe they know, right? But it would be useful. I agree with you. It would be useful for you to just, like, tick a box and have the stuff figured out for you. Yes, there are two questions in the back. Microsoft? Okay. <laughs> yes. Please tell him the answer. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, uh, about two weeks ago, we released a tool in GitHub that allows you to generate an SBOM. Okay. I know that's not in total uh, uh, provenance or something along those lines, but there may be that soon. But you can get an SBOM just on your repo right now. If you go into your settings, you can say generate a, an export and an SBOM directly out of your repo. So I advise you to use that. There you go. Happy to do some advertisements for you guys. Just, just, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> Alright, okay, so cool. I'll, I'll, I'll give you my bank account later. There, there was one question. Oh, where? No. No. Okay. Ah, oh, Okay, cool. Alright, cool. Alright, thank you very much.